Uh, so let's talk pizza. I love pizza. Who doesn't like pizza? Crazy people, that's who. I've heard that before. Oh, that was crystal chicken. All right. So there's an evolution of pizza, and it came from Italy, and you have basically two major styles uh, that derive from Italy. So the earliest, earliest style is uh, in the region of Rome where, it's, where they serve, the, uh, excuse me, the region of, where it was popularized in Rome, but the re- region of uh, Sicily, which was basically what we know today as, as, as focaccia, focaccia, and that's a big, thick, doughy piece of bread that uh, has some fat in it, usually some sort of olive oil, and you, and you mix it up. So when we were talking about our, our baker's percentage yesterday, you're usually looking, so anything above 5%, so anything below 5% fat content is there mainly to help with a little bit of extensibility, meaning it makes the dough easier to stretch because it shortens the gluten strands. That's why they call fat shortening, right? So you add shortening to something. It actually shortens gluten strands, which makes the dough more pliable and easier to stretch. And it also, fat is better at transferring heat. So anything at 5% or below based upon your flour's weight is basically there, not so much for flavor and texture, but for extensibility. Focaccia will usually have uh, 10 to 15 percent, so it's not like a, a rich dough, like brioche has a ton of fat in it, right? But it's enough to where it's a softer crumb uh, in it, and it's a moister p- a piece of bread. And they take it and they dimple it down, and they you know, top it with herbs and a little bit of, of olive oil. And they bake it, and then they started topping it with other things, but usually a very simplistic approach. You know, some sliced tomatoes. Sometimes you'll see some tomato sauce. Sometimes you'll see some arugula that's dressed lightly in olive oil and just kind of placed on top. And you slice the focaccia, and you eat like a little piece of bread, right? And this kind of stemmed into Sicilian-style pizza, which is the big loaf pan pizzas that you see in squares. And you still, if you go to Sicily today, and you're walking around on the street. They, this is kind of like Italy's version of pizza by the slice, except it's thick. And you usually have a couple different kinds that are made. And you have the guys with their scissors. They cut you little hunks of, of their Sicilian-style pizza on the crust about that thick. And you walk around, you buy a couple, and you eat them. And this raises a couple of, of issues when trying to make this at home because you have a thicker piece of dough. And then as Americans, we like to top it. I like to top it with all sorts of different stuff. But then you have the issue of how do I get my pizza crust brown on the bottom and co- while I'm cooking it all the way through and then be, still be able to top it, all right? And so the recipe that you have formulated in the pizza handout that I just gave you, uh, that was my most difficult thing. Oh, Neil, did you, did you miss one here? Okay, we got one right here. So that was the most difficult. <coughs> that was the most difficult item for me um, when developing this dough because either it would it would brown too quickly and then it would be doughy in the middle, or I'd cook at a lower temperature and it would set, but it wouldn't be that crispy on the bottom. And so some of that had to do with fat, and some of it had to do with baking temperature. So the easiest way to create this pizza is after you mix the dough according to the recipe and you let it proof, and that that recipe is enough to fill one half sheet tray. Uh, And so you take the half sheet tray that has the rim, and I like to throw a little piece of parchment paper down on top of it, and I'll form it in the rim, and I'll make a sort of a crust out of it, and I'll push up the crust a little bit on the sides, and then I'll pull that... I'll use the, uh, the piece of paper, the piece of parchment paper, to pull the Sicilian out of the pan. I'll flip the pan over, and I'll lay the parchment paper and the thing on top of the flipped over pan. And then I'll top it. And what that allows me to do is then take the whole thing and offload it onto a pizza stone. And the pizza stone is pretty important 
with this one because you want to transfer heat. Because there's so much moisture in the dough itself for its texture and also the toppings that are baked down into it, you're gonna have a hard time browning that crust. Also to the, the aluminum uh, half sheet pans that you would normally bake it in aren't that good at transferring heat. They work a, a bit of a, as an insulator. So the, one of the biggest difficulties that I had is my toppings would brown and my cheese would brown uh, before I could actually get the bottom of the crust to brown in the sheet tray. So removing it and placing it on a pizza stone is going to be a really big step. Getting a, a pizza stone in general is a nice step for uh, making pizza at home because that's a lot of things, that's, that's what's hard to replicate a good pizza in your home oven is that hearth that they bake it on because that hearth is charged with energy. It shoots into the pizza crust rapidly and it helps with your oven spring. That's how you get what's called the cornichon around the edge, pronounced and spelled just like the pickle. But if you say in the context of pizza, it's your crust around the edge, it's nice and airy. A lot of that comes from the heat that's stored in the stone that pops it up. Traditional pizza restaurants will have either a deck oven that they offload onto or a, a wood fire oven, right? So the wood fire oven version is Neapolitan style from Naples. And this is the purest's pizza, all right? So there's all these VPNs, which are basically like uh, legal restrictions that are applied to Neapolitan pizzas served in Italy, and you can get in trouble for this. Just like in France, if you're you know, trying to sell champagne that's not made in the Champagne region with Method Chef and Oise, you can get in trouble legally uh, by French law. Uh, so there's a whole lot of different things that go along with this. And number one is you can only use double lot flour. So in the United States, we base our flour, our, the way that we name our flour is based upon gluten content, right? So all-purpose flour is usually around 11%, unless you buy it in the South, where all-purpose flour is used for making biscuits, then it has around 9%, right? Bread flour is, is almost synonymous with high-gluten flour, except high-gluten flour usually has a little bit more. So bread flour has anywhere from 12.5% to 13% based upon formulation, whereas high gluten flour always contain around 14%. So it's a little bit of a tougher flour. Versus in most parts of Europe, they define their flour based upon how it's processed and how it's ground. So double lot designation means that it's very finely ground. But also too, it's formulated differently for pizza than it is for pasta. So you can have double lot flour for pizza and double lot flour for pasta. And they're actually different formulations of wheat depending upon the application. And the whole purpose of double lot pizza flour is for high temp cooking applications, which you can achieve in a normal, normal home oven, right? So you, if I were to make a double lot pizza dough with bread flour, number one, it would contain a little more gluten uh, than a double lot pizza flour from Italy, and we use caputo. Uh, but, that's, but what really makes it different is the fact that when I place it on my stone, you have what's called leoparding. So I place it in my wood fire, right? And we run the wood fire at about 800 degrees, 850 Fahrenheit, that's how much the deck is. The dome of the, of the flame is about, is upwards of 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And you get leoparding, which is that char that you see on wood fire pizzas. Now the leoparding caused by bread flour, that char tastes bitter, like you burnt it. And the char that's uh, caused by pizza flour is a good char flavor without that bitter, acrid, acrid burnt flavor. So it's important that you use double lot pizza flour for Neapolitan style pizzas. The issue though is at home, if you use double lot pizza flour, specifically if you don't have a stone, but even if you do have a stone, it's still kind of difficult because your oven can only get to 500, 550 tops. Your crust isn't going to brown properly because it's made specifically for high heat applications. So you have your toppings on your pizza brown, but your crust itself will not brown. And that's why you see a lot of approximated dough recipes that 
try and make double op pizza or, or uh, excuse me, Neapolitan style pizza in your home oven. And they tell you to use bread flour and they also tell you to use a little bit of oil because oil helps in the browning process sans having a very, very hot oven. Now, if I were to put oil in my pizza meant for my wood fire oven, it would scorch immediately because it's way too hot. And the, the heat will transfer the oil, the oil will transfer to my crust, and it scorches, boom. So technically speaking, a true Neapolitan style pizza contains the four basic ingredients. It contains double up pizza flour, water, and it needs to be a hard water that contains uh, magnesium and calcium to fit VPN regulations because magnesium and calcium in doughs, they will cross-link gluten strands and give you a chewier end product. That's also too why people say that you can only get a certain kind of bread or a certain kind of you know, pizza from Boston or from New York and it all has to do with their magical water, which is true to a certain extent in the fact that hard water is just water that contains a higher mineral content, specifically magnesium and calcium, than most other waters or what we would call soft water. And because of that, it, it lends a different texture uh, to the bread and to the pizza. But you can actually supplement with magnesium and calcium in your dough if you don't have hard water. All right. So that's a good step. Now, if you uh, are at your house and you look at one of your faucets and you haven't wiped your faucet down for a while and you have a white calcium buildup on it, well, congratulations, you have hard water. Uh, dries your skin out when you take a shower, but it's great for baking bread and making pizza dough. Okay, so water, specifically hard for the cross-linking, so hard water, salt, and it has to be sea salt, which we talked about earlier is kind of a dubious term at best, but specifically meaning that it doesn't have any other supplement and it. it's not iodized salt. So kosher salt is technically sea salt, all salt is sea salt, but you want pure salt. But in the VPN regulations, they say specifically sea salt. and yeast, and you want to use, in VPN regulations, you use um, the cake yeast, which a lot of, also known as baker's yeast, but that's not a hard and fast rule. But those are the only four ingredients allowed by law in the dough. Okay, so it's all based upon technique and fermentation, how you actually uh, get your, your flavor. Also too, outside of what you can put, in your dough. Your sauce has to be made up of San Marzano tomatoes. What's VPN? Vericate, uh, we'd have to look it up. It's some Italian terminology. So VPN stands for verification yeah, ne contr like Neopol Neop Neapolitan, but it's basically the control of, huh? The pizza police. It's the pizza police. Is it here? I was to say verifying panel of Neapolitan pizzas. No, because it's, it's, it's Italian, so that's why, I, I don't know off the top of my head. Maybe someone can Google that for us real quick, the actual VPN, and then we can butcher the actual pronunciation of it. But it's basically the, the regulatory board that, or the designations of what make a Neapolitan pizza because it's it's seen as as an important heritage um, in Italy, specifically the Neapolitan pizza and in the Naples area. Yes. Is there a part of that organization that certifies people outside of Italy? Yep, absolutely. So there are VPN certified pizza restaurants um, in the United States, and you pay a fee, and they come and they make sure that you're following all the VPN regulations. All right. Some other regulations is you can only burn hard wood. Specifically, oak is what they're looking for you to burn. They want you to be burning oak. Uh, your San Marzano tomato sauce has to be raw when it goes onto the pizza. It can't be cooked. Your pizza has to cook within uh, 45 to 90 seconds. And your, and your floor of your pizza oven has to be at least 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Couldn't that be San Marzano tomatoes grown in Central Valley? No. It has to be from the San Marzano region of Italy. Oh, okay. And we're just talking about VPN regulations. Right, right, right. 
But you want, so you extract certain things from this. So today we we're using Roma tomatoes because that's what we had on hand. We also had canned uh, San Marzano tomatoes that we added to our sauce. But it is important that your sauce remains raw. Neapolitan pizza is all about the crust. Everything is there. So in, if we're doing our F-step worksheet, right, crust would be our main flavor component. That's what we are, everything else was to enhance. So you only want a couple of toppings. You want a raw sauce. And because the, uh, the, the fire or the flame is so intense, when you drop that pizza into the oven, the sauce will actually condense down and intensify in flavor. And that's the only time it's actually cooked. If you simmer a tomato sauce on the stove for a long period of time, it changes that fresh flavor. And a lot of people, they, they're so used to cook tomato sauces on pizza that when you do a really simple fresh sauce, they love it. They lose their minds over it. All right. Also, there's only two pizzas officially recognized by VPN, which is the margarita, which is just fresh buffalo mozzarella, tomato sauce, not slices of tomato, and fresh basil, and the marinara, which is no cheese, just your straight tomato sauce, and then optionally a sprinkling of dry oregano. So it's a very purest form of pizza. Because you stretch the crust thin, and it's a thin style crust, and because you're working with it in the wood fire oven, you want to make sure that you're you're being a minimalist with the toppings. And we'll have all sorts of toppings to play with tonight. Uh, but the one thing that you want to make sure that you don't do is overtop your Neapolitan pizzas because it's going to rip and tear the delicate crust. Now, what you'll see a lot of the times for home formulated pizzas is they're going to load them with oil to make them extensible. And a little bit of oil is important to allow you to brown the pizza crust. But also, too, they're going to give you a higher hydration dough. Now, what I found in a lot of my research and also a lot of R&D and just testing different uh, hydration rates is universally across the board, all pizza dough is low hydration. And that's why I was talking the other night about how Italians are liars, but not really. They're just, the, the, there's a lot of misinformation out there specifically on the crust because you look at the tradition of the tomato sauce on an Italian style pizza is very, very simple. It's all about the crust. And once you master the crust recipe, then it's just about the toppings and anyone can buy buffalo mozzarella and basil to make a very classic thing. So it's all about the, not only the ratio for your crust, but also in the formulation of it. So for our Neapolitan pizza, we use a 58% hydration rate, which when you mix it is very stiff, okay? But it's not quite as stiff as if you mixed it with bread flour at 58% hydration because there's a little bit less gluten. And so that's important. So now we know that the more gluten you have in your dough, the, the stiffer it will be or the more water it can absorb. So you need to use a higher hydration rate. So if you have an, the double up pizza flour that contains around 11% gluten, it's not going to be quite as stiff, but it's still going to be a little hard to work. Okay, 2% salt, a spike of yeast. And that's important because the way that you make your Neapolitan pizza crust extensible is through fermentation. So you have to do a long, slow fermentation. So the first rise is 18 hours. So for a large batch of dough, we literally use a single finger pinch of yeast. We dissolve it in the water. We mix in the flour, mix in the salt. And then you want to mix it to a, a very, very slowly into a homogenous state until it passes the window pane test. The really hardcore guys hand knead it and they have muscles like linebackers because it's a stiff dough in the first place. And then you want to let it do a slow bulk fermentation over the course of about 18 hours. Once you do that long, slow bulk fermentation, you divide it in a 270 to 290 gram rounds that you round off. And then you allow to proof for another two to four hours and sometimes even longer. What happens is as they, the longer they proof, the more supple they become and the harder to handle, but also the more extensible they can be. Also a VPN designation is a Neapolitan pizza is 
270 grams to 290 grams when, before it's baked and it's stretched to a 12, ounce, 12 inch disc. How long is it proof of? So proof is 18 hours. And really the longer the better. So, that, so this, is all, this can all change, but the way we do it is we, so at university you're, you're doing a long, slow bulk fermentation, which is 18 hours, and the proof is two to, anywhere from two to six hours. Yeah, excuse me. So there's some guys who will slow down fermentation through refrigeration. There's other guys who do a triple fermentation process where they knock it down twice. I've tried that. I find it's hard to get a, a poofy cornichon around the edge if you do that because the yeast is very tired. So you, they basically they do a bulk fermentation. They punch it down. They reform the dough, and they allow it to bulk ferment for a second time. They punch it down, divide it, and then they allow it to proof again. Uh, so it all depends upon your style. Also what happens too is the longer you allow the pizza dough to ferment or proof, uh, the more available starches there are, which can be a good thing, but it also can be a bad thing because the more available starches that turn into sugars will uh, cause scorching at such a high temperature. But there are some pizza hacks for Neapolitan pizza dough at home where they tell you to mix in a small amount of yeast and let it ferment for five days in your refrigerator. And what happens while you're doing that is so the, uh, the double off flour in your dough formulation will actually brown. Okay. So with having the dough fermented properly, you then stretch it. And there's a whole process that I'm going to demonstrate called opening the dough. You never want to roll pizza dough with a rolling pin. It destroys its texture and its structural integrity. So instead what you do is a process where you form it into a disc by gently pressing it outwards and you play patty cake with it where you put your hand down on the disc, gently stretch it out and you let the dough speak to you. You don't stretch it past the point of where it wants to tear and you can feel it. You can feel the extensibility and you do a light stretch, fold it over your hand as I turn my palm up, quarter turn down. So I stretch from the side, now the side that I stretch going to be folded over and turned down towards me and you do that a couple of times right and you build a rhythm to open the dough and what that does is it pushes out all of the co2 that was in the ball itself out to the outer edge of the dough which allows you to have that corner on that springs okay from there you want to lightly uh, flour a work surface but not i mean when i say lightly i mean like a little sprinkling so it doesn't stick. In Italy, you'll see these guys, they have a setup where they have a little a, a marble work surface for their dough with a little lip. And that lip is right below their work surface where they can place a, um, a pizza peel. And so you very quickly add your sauce, add your toppings, you put your pizza peel on that lip, and then you pull the dough off onto the pizza peel, and you take it and you place it onto your deck in the oven. You can't use cornmeal on all that kind no. of stuff? No. Cornmeal will, will scorch. It will burn instantly. Is it used in other times? Other, not in this one, but other things? It can be. Yeah. It can be. You can use it at home, but... Yeah, you can use it at home. So, because even, even any excess Neapolitan pizza flour that is on the bottom of the dish that isn't incorporated into the dough will scorch and burn. In, in the, on the deck when you place that pizza on. So it's important that you have nothing on the bottom of the pizza. And so that forces you to work really, really quick, uh, quickly. Some people like the texture of cornmeal on the bottom of their dough. Some people like the crunch that cornmeal gives their dough when they add it into their, their pizza dough recipe. None of these pizza dough recipes contain cornmeal because to me it's, it's just, it's a textural thing that you can add and if you want to add it, you want to add your cornmeal. Well, we just do it because it's the only way to pick some so you don't get slide off and on the pizza peel. Right. I mean, that's, that's what we found. Yeah. Well, t today we, we, won't be, we won't be using it because it'll scorch. But it, it, does, it does work to a certain extent. But if you, if you work quickly and you have your dough fermented properly, you won't need it. It'll just be a personal preference. If you want to use it, use it. It's not going to make your pizza any better or, or worse. But if you do add about 10 to 15% of cornmeal uh, as a replacement for your, for your flour, it's going to give you a sturdier crust. OK? 
Okay. Neapolitan pizza is all about the chew, right? You chew it and you chew it. Like that's, that's what the Neapolitan pizza texture is about. You're not really looking for a super crispy, crispy crust. Okay. I'm wondering if our dough is a little bit higher hydration or something. What's that? I'm wondering if our dough is a little higher hydration. Or something. It could be. So the reason why you have a low hydration pizza dough is because you're putting moist ingredients on top of your pizza and you're cooking it very rapidly, not a very long time in the oven, and you need that pizza dough to cook through by the time your ingredients are browned. And if you have a higher hydration dough, it'll lead to soggy or bready pizza, which in a traditional sense isn't desirable. So then you had the people from Naples, they came over to New York, they did a basic, what's called by Peter Reinhardt, which I think is a good term, a neo-Neapolitan pizza, where they, it was the same basic formulation. So New York style is the same basic formulation of Neapolitan, except they use bread flour, because at the time, double lot flour wasn't super available. And then they add in a little bit of oil to make it more extensible so they can stretch a larger disc and have you know, that thin floppy crust. So they add oil, usually about 5%. They have the hard water that is part of, that applies some of the texture by cross-linking the calcium and magnesium ions, which gives you a sturdier gluten structure. And then they have deck ovens and the deck ovens run a little bit lower. So you're looking at about anywhere from 550, which is admittedly low. Most guys don't do this, but I, but I have heard of some guys who run as low as a 550 deck, but you're looking more towards the 650 range and some as high as 700. Now there's exceptions to these rules where you have some of the classic joints that do the coal fire decks, where they have the coal underneath the decks and they're running those of upwards of, of 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm, I'm sure they're using uh, double lot pizza flour because a bread flour will scorch if, uh, if it's cooked at that kind of temperature. And so they stretch out. And so because you have such a thin, delicate crust, Again, the toppings are sparse. You don't commonly see a New York pizza that's totally loaded uh, with toppings because the, the, the pizza wouldn't be able to handle it. It would basically collapse under its weight. And a technique that I like for both Neapolitan pizzas and New York pizzas that the New York guys kind of developed is they top first with their toppings and they take their sauce with a spoon and they just sprinkle it on in little pockets. And as all the toppings cook down together, it looks like the pizza is completely sauce. You have little pockets of sauce. But that keeps your, your, uh, your pizza crust from sogging out during the cooking process because it's, it's overly sauced. And then when you eat it, you're getting little pockets of tomato sauce. So it's going to be the perception that the whole pizza is sauced. Uh, but that's not necessarily true. So based on this, what you're saying is that you're not... If you want a thin crust, you basically have to make a New York Neapolitan in the oven. Yes. So you can do the Neapolitan pizza hack, which requires a baking steel, which we have. We have a couple of baking steels in there. And so the whole idea behind that is so you have a stone that is the same temperature as the steel, but steel can transfer heat faster and more efficiently than a stone can. So what you do is you crank your oven up to 550 degrees Fahrenheit or as high as it can go and you put it on the top rack of your oven and you let it charge with heat for about an hour and then you can make a pizza dough formulation using the Neapolitan pizza recipe in your book and, uh, and you, you go through the whole fermentation process. You load it onto, right, be right before you load it onto the steel, you turn your broiler element on which is there to replicate the flame that looks over the top of the dome when cooking in a wood fire oven. You offload, the, uh, the steel is charged sufficiently with heat to transfer pizza, or transfer heat to the pizza, giving you some of that char, some of that leoparding, and then you have the broiler element on top that radiates heat down 
to replicate the fire. So you, you place it on the steel? You place it directly on the steel. And it's just an inch or... Yeah, it's about, a, about an inch to an inch and a half away from the broiler element. And that's the closest you can get to replicating uh, one at home. You can also buy round pizza stone inserts that fit on your Weber grill. And uh, so in a, in a coal fire, because coal radiates heat uh, very efficiently, uh, you can get that stone up to about 700 degrees, sometimes as high as 750 if you build a really monstrous fire. Uh, and then you can do a Neapolitan uh, dough directly onto that, or Neapolitan pizza directly onto that grill, yes. So back to the steel, uh -huh. you actually, after you preheat it and before you put the pizza in, mm -hmm. then you're gonna broil. So you're actually broiling. Yeah, because it takes, it takes a, a couple of minutes usually for most home broilers to kind of get, yeah, get to full heat. Um, so, but at that point you already have, you've already charged the, the steel with heat. So you turn the broiler element on, wait a couple of minutes, then pizza goes on. No, so it's just a separate baking steel. They weigh about 25 pounds and it's about, you know, this thick and you just pop it on your, on your heat shelf. And you ever turn the jet checker broiler off in between? It seems like you're charging it, the broiler on, and you're baking it with the broiler. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm charging it with my oven. So I'm setting my oven to 550 oh. for about 45 to 60 oh. minutes to fully charge it. And then right before baking, I switch my broiler element on. I thought it was charged with the broiler. No, and if you're, and if you're making multiple pies, you're going to have to then turn your oven back on and let the stone come back up to temperature for about 10 minutes and you throw the next pizza on. Does a pizza stone take that long to heat? Because we don't even need it that much. Yeah, uh, yeah, a pizza stone you want to heat for at least a half an hour, yeah, like but, but preferably longer, 45 minutes. You know, so I just, I usually stick it, I stick my stone in there and I turn on my oven to the highest setting when I'm, you know, getting the pizza stuff ready and I just kind of forget about it and let it, let it heat up. And how long will you keep the pizza in there? So on the steel, when you're doing a Neapolitan pizza, it should bake in three to four minutes. Um, a New York style on a regular stone in your home oven takes about anywhere from seven to 12 minutes, depending upon how crispy you like your crust and how hot your oven can actually get. In my home gas oven, I can set to 550. Uh, I can get a New York style pizza out in under 10 minutes. So I'm looking about the eight minute mark. Okay. Then you have the Chicago style. So for me, the, the Neapolitan style pizza was difficult. It was diff difficult to crack that code, even though it's, it's simple, right? You look at the formulation and it seems very simple. Because a lot of Neapolitan recipes out there are formulated for home ovens. The ones that are formulated for wood fire ovens, a lot of people aren't sharing. And they contained a higher hydration. A lot of them contained bread flour and a lot of them contained oil, right? All of which are there to replicate the heat transfer that you get from a a regular uh, pizza oven. So from a technical standpoint, the technique of learning how to open the dough and how to slowly ferment the dough, because when I figured out that it was a low hydration dough, I had a really hard time uh, figuring out how I'm gonna actually make this dough workable. I didn't understand enough about fermentation yet to know that I had to do a long drawn out fermentation uh, to make the dough actually extensible. Chicago style pizza was really, really hard to figure out because I believe there's literally a misinformation campaign out there on Chicago style pizza. So when Food and Wine Magazine goes to Pizzeria Uno and asks them for their crust recipe, it's completely false. And it's, fal and it's false by making that formulation and realizing that the texture is nothing even close to what it is. And so what makes a Chicago style pizza, what makes the crust, and whether you add cornmeal or not, is a personal textural preference, right? But what makes the Chicago style pizza, yes please, is it's low hydration. About 40% water, okay? And high fat, really high fat. About 30% fat. And that's usually in the form of a mixture of about 20% light olive oil and 
10% corn oil, which gives you that supposed buttery tasting pizza crust. So my argument was, well, if I'm supposed to mix these fats together to give the perception of a buttery pizza crust, why not just add butter? And I do. With no shame. With no shame. <laughs> and you flip the percentages. What do you mean? Well, you flip the, the 20% to the butter and 10% to the olive oil. I did. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, some guys will adamantly claim that Chicago-style pizza dough is a biscuit crust in the sense that you mix it very lightly and you form a biscuit or a biscuit style, and that's what makes it flaky. But when you watch these guys on TV actually working in their kitchen, I've never actually been able to work in a Chicago-style pizza restaurant. If I did, they wouldn't show me how to make their dough anyways. But when you see these guys with their dough on TV, you can see enough to see that that's not a biscuit dough. That's a dough, that's a rich dough with a well-developed gluten structure, okay? Uh, but some people will adamantly claim that it's a biscuit dough, which is fine, and there might be some restaurants that do it that way, so that might be something that you experiment with. I've experimented with both, with minimal mixing and extensive mixing, my favorite way to, to do it. I think I still have the minimalist mi mixing in your handout, right? So I'm, I'm not sure if I ever changed that, because I continue to to develop these recipes past the time where I actually wrote these recipes up. So 20% butter, 10% olive oil, 40% water hydration, salt, and then mix for 10 minutes in a KitchenAid mixer. You wanna mix it really well and really develop that gluten structure. Okay, and what that does is it gives you a soft, supple dough that's easy to work with, and you press it into a cast iron pan, and again, it's a minimalistic approach because it's all about the crust. You reverse the operations of loading your pan because you're going to be baking it for a long time. Throw the sliced cheese on the bottom, then you pack it with sausage, with ground sausage, and then you cover with tomatoes. And in, and in this case, they use what are called nine to one canned tomatoes. And it's actually a brand. It's a brand of diced tomatoes. And that's the closest thing that you get to what, and that's what a lot of the guys buy in large cans. So it's actually fresh diced tomatoes that they season with a little bit of salt and pepper and they just spread across the top. And then you bake it and in a cast iron pan, it, and they use actual, you know, baking pans that are made for this purpose. But the best thing to do is go out and get a 10 inch uh, cast iron pan and you bake it in a you know, 375, 400 degree oven, 425, depending upon how your oven works for about 30 to 35 minutes. And then the easiest way to get it out is, I mean, sometimes you can serve it in the pan. I just don't like cutting it in my cast iron pan because you ruin the surface. So you take a little offset spatula, kind of go around the rim, and then you get underneath the lip and you kind of give your pan a little tilt and you just whoosh, and it'll kind of pop out for you. Yeah, there's a place in St. Louis that I'm pretty sure it's very much like this. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that dough does kind of resemble a little bit of a biscuit. Well, it does, absolutely. But when, so even when you, when you mix it, the way that I mixed it, it makes it more homogenous. But when you actually bite into it, it tastes like a biscuit crust, almost tastes like a pie crust because there's so much fat in it. So this is me as an outsider who's obsessed with dough, looking at pizza, saying, hey, pizza is all about the dough. So let me see if I can hack some doughs. I haven't eaten that at all the Chicago or even, even close to the Chicago pizza joints out there. I've never eaten at any true blue New York style pizza joints, meaning that I've never been in New York and eaten there. I've had enough New York styles and I've researched enough about it to understand what that dough is supposed to be, the characteristics of it. But again, this just gives you the information and that's why it's important to understand the percentages uh, and the baker's percentage because you can look at my formulations and you can say, well, yeah, you know, I mean, this is kind of a, a decent starting point for Chicago style crust, but I think X. I think maybe it should be a little flakier, so I'm going to mix it less. Uh, I think it's actually, it actually is too buttery. I think I want to try you know, corn oil instead of butter. But it gives you a starting point to at least jump off from instead of just a completely wrong 
wrong information on actually how the dough is itself is formulated. Yes. Clarified butter, regular butter. A uh, whole butter melted. Whole butter. Yes. Okay. So back to the percentages then on the Neapolitan. Uh, so it's back over here. Okay, so the 58% hydration, water. Yeah, 58% hydration, yes. So I, your instructions here are quite, do you, 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 once you've mixed it for the 10 minutes, then you, you bulk ferment it or not? Yes. Okay, because then you said you put it in a pan and I was confused. Okay, is that is that what it says in the instructions? No, no, no. no I thought that's what you were saying. Okay, I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. So you, so this all goes through the, the two the two step process of bulk fermentation and forming. So instead of actually rounding off the the Chicago style pizza and letting it ferment for an, another time, after the bulk fermentation, I just punch it down and I press it into the pan. I press up the edges and I load it up and and it's a short and make it. ferment uh, fermentation too. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the the other question I had was you said a pinch in a Neapolitan world pinches a lot less than three grams, I think, didn't it? Yes, it is. But I mean, it, so it, de it depends on, on the environment. Three grams for the formulation in there is gonna, it's still a very small amount of yeast. It's gonna give you an overnight fermentation, uh, but it all depends on also too, because this was, this was originally formulated for a pizza, a pizza class that I did. And so I had to scale it to more the, the home cook who was interested in pizza, but didn't really want to like take a ton of time. And I said, look, if you're gonna do a Neapolitan pizza at home, you know, you start with three grams, uh, you ferment it overnight, and then when you wake up the next day, you punch it down and you round it, which will make the dough workable and make it possible to do. Um, but really, I prefer an 18 hour fermentation, which means just a small pinch of yeast for activity. And this is actually, this is next on my, on my hit list. Uh, once things calm down for us a little bit, I'm gonna go through and, and redo all the pizza recipes, the formulations that we did even after we further experimented, and then we're gonna shoot some video on it and make that a vid video available on our website. So that's, that's the next thing down the, down the road for us, okay? Then you have the bastard child of pizza, which is California pizza. <laughs> which all, all pizza loving aficionados hate. You don't have a California pizza style dough um, in your handout only because this, it's just pretty, it's a, it's a bready dough and you can find those, that's very widely available. Also the Sicilian style, if scaled onto a disc, uh, is a pretty close approximation. You actually, you just stretch it uh, thinner. But you have a, a, a thicker, stiffer crust that's more bready, so it can stand up to all the toppings that you put on in the California style. It's basically fusion pizza. And uh, you know what? Like, I love a good round, ta uh, round table pizza. You know, their Maui Zowie is delicious and just loaded with like pineapple and pork and barbecue sauce and whatever. I know I'm supposed to say that I don't like it, but I do. You know, and it's pizza's pizza, so there's, all dif there's different styles. Uh, but this is kind of where, I mean, this was spearheaded by Wolfgang Puck. Uh, who started getting all creative on us, and he's from Austria, so he could give a, a crap what Italians think about him anyways. You know, so he starts playing around and getting all fusionistic on his pizzas, and then that spawns stuff like the California Pizza Kitchen, and then that spawns, you know, other outlets. Uh, but it's basically, California pizza is bread that's shaped into a disc and then topped uh, crazy. I actually like, a, on my California-style pizza, I like a thick outer crust. And so the way that I get that is I do a Sicilian style dough, do a bulk fermentation, I divide it out, you get those pizza pans with the little holes in it. And then, uh, so your Sicilian style dough should make enough for, for two California style pizzas on a, I, I believe they're the 14 inch pans or whatever the standard pans are that you find at your supermarket. And I press it out a little bit larger than the pan and I roll the crust back in to make a little ring and I crimp it and then I actually let it proof again. So I cover with plastic wrap and let it rise for about 45 minutes to an hour. And the, the center portion is stretched fairly thin. I mean, it's still, I mean, it's not as thin as like a New York style, but it doesn't really proof too much in the middle, uh, but it proofs around the edge. And then when you bake it, you get that nice big thick oven spring. Then you brush it with a little bit of olive oil or something. And then you just top the hell out of it. You put a lot of sauce, put a lot of cheese. You don't cheese stuff that rim? You could, absolutely. 
And that's how you do cheese stuff is you just have little, you know, batons of cheese that you basically just roll in the crust and you crimp it down. You can cinch it with a fork if you need to. Huh? That's just like what we had when I was little. We had the Appian Way. The what? Uh, Appian Way Pizza. Appian Way Pizza. Every Sunday, you know, it's like, but that's, in essence, mm -hmm. what it was. That's in the 50s. <laughs> and, the, and the most genius of all the pizza creators out there are the guys who figured out how to do take and bake. Because if you think about it, you have no ovens. You have a, some high school kids who just top it to go and then wrap in plastic wrap. And like, here you go. Have fun. 14 bucks. Thank you. It's the most in, ingenious of all the culinary business models out there is a the take and bake pizza. High profit, low labor costs. Takeout counter. No servers, nothing. What's that? Zanos does it. Yeah. It's great. I'm just, I'm jealous. I don't think of it. All right, you guys ready to actually get in there and make some pizza? Any, any question on, on pizzas, doughs, or anything like that? All right, cool. We'll go do a quick pizza demonstration and uh, go from there.